Hey there, on today's edition of Behind the Charts, we're gonna hear from Jonathan Krinsky. Jonathan's the technical analyst at Baycrest Partners in the New York area. Jonathan has the unique background of being a former PGA Tour professional. So we don't have a lot of former pro golfers talking about transitioning into the world of technical analysis, but it turns out that a lot of the lessons you learn trying to outperform on the golf course map pretty well to how you outperform in the financial markets. Um, Jonathan's had a fantastic career uh, in the financial industry, working with mentors like Phil Roth, who's a name that's uh, well known to many of you from Miller Tabak, um, and he works a lot with institutional clients in the uh, in the Northeast and uh, elsewhere around uh, the United States. But it's a great way of thinking about how technical analysis should fit into the overall investment process. So here's my comments uh, and commentary and uh, discussion earlier with Jonathan Krinsky from Baycrest Partners. So we're here with Jonathan Krinsky, Chief Market Technician at Baycrest Partners. Thanks so much for joining us, Jonathan. Yeah, it's good great to, to see be you. Here, Dave. Um, for those that are not familiar with you and your work, can you give us like the brief background? How did you get to this point, particularly with technical analysis? How did you come into that uh, toolkit, and how did you incorporate it into what you do? Yeah, so I started in the industry uh, back about twelve years ago, December two thousand seven. Yeah. So right at the uh, the end of, Good of, that, of that bull market. <laughs> and uh, it was actually great timing in the sense that it, it kind of uh, built my uh, underpinnings for technical analysis. Mm -hmm. and, and the main reason was early in 2008, as the market started to deteriorate, yeah. I was working at a, a sell side brokerage firm and we had to have a morning research meeting. Mm -hmm. And I remember coming in every morning and the fundamental analysts almost on a daily basis, their notes were cutting numbers, cutting estimates, right. cutting price target, but keeping the buy rating. And it, <laughs> it just was day after day. And it just didn't seem very much value add because right. they kept the buy rating, but the stocks kept going lower. So if you kept buying it, you kept losing money. Uh, we also had a technician, a uh, very uh, prominent name, Phil Roth, who I worked, sure. uh, who worked there. And, and he was at the same time in those morning research meetings was coming out with sell recommendations and, and short ideas. Uh. And that actually, worked very well obviously and it was actually making clients money on, on, in the bear market so right. i kind of quickly gravitated towards technical analysis yeah and obviously there's a there's a, a place for both but i think that really um uh, jump-started my my passion and understanding and for the value of technical analysis yeah. it's so interesting so i started in uh, middle of 2000 so i had kind of a similar experience right i started and then my first couple of years are all about cyclical bear markets secular bear markets just all this destructive thing how do you how do you think that you know, having your initiation into the markets being that sort of phase. Now we're at this point where anyone that started investing in the last 10 years has never seen that. How has that beginning, do you think, shaped you as an analyst to where you're at now? Uh, I think it gives me much more appreciation uh, and respect for the, for the declines in the markets. Yeah. Uh, you know, the last, this time last year was probably um, one of the closest uh, we've seen is sure. very short, but the the uh, magnitude is pretty severe. Yeah. Uh, so I have much more res respect for those type of markets. Uh, <laughs> you know, you could argue whether uh, you get a little too, too uh, biased when you sure. start to see the, the declines. <laughs> right. But I think um, overall, it's good, and it gives me a good perspective on that markets do in fact go both up and down. Yeah, right. <laughs> At some point, we'll all learn that again, I think, yes. as a market, not not today, apparently. Um, you know, one of the questions I love to ask people is what I'd call sort of the worst call question. Is there a time when you've had a difficult stretch or a call that went against you or a trade that went against you? And what did you learn from that? How did you sort of navigate through that and, you know, move on afterwards? Yeah, um, obviously, there, there are plenty of, of bad calls, as we all, we all have. Um, yeah. I think one that comes to mind, I think it was in 2014 okay. uh, so we had a, a really good year in 2013 on the markets mm -hmm. um, uh, 2014 I think was uh, known maybe for the Ebola scare mm -hmm. in the fall of 2014 right. but it was it was actually early in 2014 the market was starting to show some signs of, of deterioration starting to roll over um, and I, I think we we're still above the 200 day moving average in the S&P but internals were starting to deteriorate a little bit yeah and I, I certainly got a little too cautious calling, you know, maybe looking for a bigger decline, even though the trend, you know, if you have a rising 200 moving average, that the trend is still How up. How bad can it be? Right? And, and even, <laughs> yeah. even if ultimately that does prove to roll over, yeah. you know, you can be a little bit more patient and, and usually you don't see a precipitous waterfall decline yeah. above a rising 200 day. Um, so I think I got a little too negative, a little too early. Mm -hmm. And you have to kind of, you know, reevaluate things and, yeah. and kind of, <clears throat> you know, obviously state that you've been a little bit wrong and, and 
you know, things as, as the facts change, you have to change your views. I love it. Yeah. I love the, uh, the honesty, the honest yeah. approach to it. Good for you. Um, I'd love to know more about your process or particularly your routines. Is there a um, routine that you follow? So if you're sitting down first thing in the morning, how do you kind of consume all the information you have access to? Do you have a regular routine for, for incorporating all the information you have access to and then particular with charts, with technical analysis? Do you have a normal process that you follow? Um, well, I'm, I'm pretty good about following markets throughout the day, even overnight, okay. you know, watching futures. And, and when I get up, I kind of check global markets. So you kind of have a, a sense of what's going on in the macro front, yeah. uh, even before I get into the desk in the morning. Mm -hmm. um, and then in the morning, yeah, it's, it's just, again, looking at the overall overseas markets, seeing mm -hmm. how Asia and Europe traded. Um, obviously, that, that tends to have a lot of influence on our markets. Yeah. Um, markets trading 24 hours now. Uh, and then I'm kind of, you know, looking more at the sector level of things. Uh, there's been a big <coughs> correlation lately between <coughs> interest rates and how that affects different sectors of the market. Is it, you know, if, if interest rates are higher, we know it's going to be tend to be a little bit more of a value oriented day financially than outperforming. And, you know, interest rates are, are driving a lot of the thematic uh, rotations under under the market right now. So, right. Um, you know, that kind of gives you me a broad sense of, of what I'm looking for in the market. And then, uh, you know, really, as we get closer to the to the opening bell, I'm trying to look more down on the stock level, trying to find uh, little shorter term trading ideas for clients that might be actionable, um, both on the long and short side. So you mentioned, um, <clears throat> you know, sort of the short term orientation, having to follow you know, all the movements in the market. How do you balance as an analyst the short-term noise or the short-term fluctuations with the need to stay true to the long-term trend, right? So you talk about the slope of the 200-day moving average, a little more of a long-term kind of structural thing. How do you balance your attention or your priorities between the short-term and the long-term? Yeah, so uh, you always have the long-term in the back in the back of your mind. That drives okay. yep. everything. And, and really what's, I think, a little bit unique about uh, – some of the clients I talk to is I have both long-term oriented mm -hmm. that don't care so much about the day-to-day -day movements. Right. Um, but I also have some faster money clients mm -hmm. and they're really looking for their short-term movements. And what I've found a lot lately and is that sometimes the best short-term trades actually go opposite to the long-term trend. <laughs> That's um, right. yep. And when you, you know, I think uh, so <clears throat> September was a perfect example of that where we had one of the biggest momentum, what I would call momentum unwinds we've seen in a while where yeah. um, momentum stocks are doing great. Uh, the stocks that have been going up for the last few months were really going up. People are piling, piling into those. Yeah. Uh, some of the growth names, software, uh, even some of the bond proxies. And then conversely, you had some of the value names that have just been getting destroyed for months and months. And you kind of had this, uh, just this really stretched rubber band where yep. High momentum, we're doing really well. Low momentum, we're doing really poorly. Yeah. And that reached an extreme. And when that started to unwind, even though the long-term trend still favored those, yeah. you could make a lot of money in a short amount of time betting on that convergence. So right. um, you kind of have to have to weigh that. Whereas, you know, it really goes back to what is your time frame? If right. you're a long-term investor, don't get so much caught up in the noise. If you can trade the short-term movements, then you have to pay attention to, you know, when things reach that tipping point. And that's where you can kind of go against some of the long-term trades. I love that. So making sure that the content, the information you're looking at is in line with your investment horizon. That's fantastic. Totally. That's great guidance. Um, your background is very unique. And I, I love hearing about lessons people have learned or, <laughs> or techniques or, or practices or, or behaviors that they've learned outside of finance and how they apply it to the industry. So can you tell us, I mean, you, you've played golf in a pretty high level. Can you tell us just a little bit about what you did there and then how have you, any lessons that you've taken from your golf game and applied it to investing in any way? Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> I started up prior to being in the finance industry as in the golf industry as yep. a uh, PGA professional. Mm -hmm. I was an assistant professional and um, obviously loved golf at that point, but also knew that I didn't necessarily want to uh, make that my career. Yeah. I knew I liked to play golf. I just didn't know if I wanted to be involved <laughs> fully <laughs> for the rest of my life. So um Made the transition over to uh, to the financial industry, as I said, in 2007. Yeah. Um, and I've been very happy with that move. I think some of the <clears throat> lessons I learned from from golf, and actually, um, one of the interview questions my first employer asked me was, you know, what is something, you know, that you think you've learned from the golf industry that right. can be applied and 
and uh, you know, there's a there's an essence of working under pressure, trying to stay calm mm. uh, under pressure, especially if you if you're playing at a higher level yeah. uh, in golf, and and you know when when you, you're in a tournament situation where <clears throat> you really can't make any mistakes, or any mistakes become very costly. Right. That obviously applies to uh, to the financial markets. So you sure. Kind of try to <clears throat> keep keep calm. Emotion. The, the more you can take emotions out of it and go through your process, right? Mm. We have a process when we're uh, getting ready to hit, hit each shot in golf, right. and then you have a process when you're analyzing a stock or a market or putting on a trade. You have to go through that same process and don't let emotions, you know, take get the best of you. Yeah, yeah. I love that example, um, and it, <clears throat> it makes me think of uh, when I was playing with my father not too long ago, and. Uh, we were at a par three hole, and he goes to uh, he goes to swing and completely missed the fact that there was a headwind coming at him. And I've used that example in a lot of presentations where you have the right tools, but you don't have a good awareness of what's going on around you. Um, how do you how did you think about um, you know an awareness of when you're you know when you're playing golf and again when you're you know sort of when you're investing? What how important is that? And so how do you get a good sense of what's going on around you? Yeah, no, I think that's a perfect analogy. Yeah. Uh, the same tools that you use uh, for one environment, if, if it's a very windy day, yeah. um, you don't necessarily, you, you kind of have to adapt and you don't necessarily want to use the same, same method. You want to use the same process, but yeah. you have to maybe use a different shot or right. apply a different method. And I'll, I'll use the example of sometimes uh, momentum investing is, I think is very successful, but um, mm. there are times when you have to recognize that maybe uh, the, that shot or that trade is not the it's not the best environment for that trade. Right, so right. If you're going into the wind, you don't want to hit a, a super high shot. You want to kind of keep it low. Yeah, right, right, right. And how many times have we seen? I mean, I think our peers or other investors that stick with something that's not working, you know, well well beyond when they should probably be rotating. And that's a, that's a great example. Can we pivot back a little bit to to a market discussion? You talked about some leadership technology and otherwise. How did you think through this year? I mean, it was a really interesting environment where a bull market phase, overall US equities doing fine, global equities holding up okay, but you had a lot of leadership from the defensive side, from utilities and real estate for a lot of the year. I ended up you know, being looking like the top sector fantastic charts um, same thing small cap underperforming at a time when you probably expect it to outperform how how do you as an analyst balance those messages of the chart going up of the markets but then the leadership picture gets kind of cloudy or, or uh, you know unintuitive how do you balance those kind of things yeah I think um, obviously we, we talked about interest rates are driving a lot of the correlations and yeah. the trades so yep. um, the the kind of message early in the year and, and into the summer as, as the macroeconomic data was kind of getting a little weaker, I think people were kind of using the bond proxies as a little bit of a, a hedge. I heard the barbell mm. strategy where you would buy high growth names that do well when, when overall growth is lower. Right. And then you also are buying some of the defenses, which give you a little bit of safety. Um, if bonds continue to move higher as they did throughout the summer, right. they actually do well. Uh, so I think... <clears throat> That was there was a little bit of, of masking some of the concerns the market had in the sense that uh, if if we came into the year and told you what interest rates were going to do and mm. they were going to continue to move lower and some of the concerns globally, yeah. you may not have thought the market would have done as well as it did. But it did because instead of going to cash, investors were actually buying the defenses and the savings mm, right. as well as the high growth names, which are actually such a big part of the market. I think a lot of people forget that software is actually, it, it, you can divide the market into 11 S&P 500 sectors, yeah. and then below that you can go into the industry groups, sure. there's 24 of those. Software is the biggest industry group weighting in the uh, S&P, right. it's about 12%. Okay. So when you have uh, investors moving into the high growth, a lot of those tend to be software names, which have done well as interest rates have moved down. So it's the market's actually done pretty well even though if we had told you what the macro data was going to do, what bonds were going to do, yeah. what even gold was going to do coming into this year, you may have not thought that would have been the case. So right. um, that's, it's been an interesting year in that sense. Yeah. 
What um, what do you think when you when you're looking into year end and just you know we're we're in the seasonally strongest part of the year now, November through May. Um, we're in a position where the market's now you know at or near the all time highs. IFA you know in the, in you know sort of developed Europe and Asia you know testing maybe, maybe even to new highs today. Um, how do you think about that going into year end versus, you know, potentially we're overextended, uh, you know, depending on some of the charts, you're getting divergences on a chart like Apple, you're getting, you know, higher highs, but, you know, momentum starting to slope down. What do you see going into year end and into the beginning of next year? So I think the biggest message from us is that uh, global equities peaked in January of 2018. Most global equities, uh, if we're talking a broad basket of global stocks have still not surpassed their January 2018 peak. Right. Small caps peaked, I believe, in September of, of 2018. Mm -hmm. um, but for all intents and purposes, they haven't gone anywhere either since since uh, January of 2018. So we've yeah. had this 18 to 24 month period of, of really just sideways congestion right. for global equities, for small cap uh, U.S. equities. <clears throat> so our view is that that's a, a pause. And by the way, throughout that period, we had the big drawdown in the fourth quarter of last year. Which, right. Um, didn't quite get to 20% of the S&P 500, but yeah. for all intents and purposes, close. most stocks under the surface experience a bear market. So yeah. um, we're of the belief that we've gone through this sideways consolidation. We're now starting to emerge higher from it. Yes, some big mega cap stocks may be a bit extended, and that's kind of led to the S&P and the NASDAQ showing some bit of negative divergences. I think the bull case, though, is that uh, we see a bit of a rotation. Uh, our call, actually, for the next few months is that we finally see that relative strength in the small caps. Uh, yep. Seasonally, we actually tend to see a bottom in the relative performance of small caps to large caps around mm. November, December. Okay. And then you see that relative strength actually, uh, and again, this is just the average historical pattern over the last 30 years, you tend to see some outperformance in small caps into the springtime. So that Got would kind it. of make sense from a, from a seasonal perspective. Hmm. Uh, we also have an interesting dynamic. We looked at when the small Russell 2000 has gone at least 52 weeks without a 52 week high. Okay. And then you finally make a 52 week high. Mm -hmm. What happens going forward? And that's happened uh, 11 times since the Russell 2000. Uh, we have data back to about 1979. Yeah. And 10 of 11 times when that happens, small caps are actually higher six months later for a median gain of about 13.4 percent. So basically, what does that tell you? We've gone mini bear market, whether it's whether it's a 20% drawdown or not, we yeah. haven't made progress in 52 weeks, you finally emerge from that base, that tends to bode well for small caps going forward. So that's kind of how we're looking at things right now. Very interesting. I like how that lines up potentially. What so you know we talk about seasonal trends, right? And 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 you mentioned small cap outperformance at a, at a certain time of the year. I've always sort of struggled a little bit about how you balance cycles, right? The cyclical analysis, the tendencies, what tends to happen versus what actually is happening, right? So what do you do when you see, you know, you have a seasonal trend, you have a pattern you're, you're normally going to bet on, but all of a sudden the chart looks very different. How do you balance those two or reconcile those? So any seasonal or cycle and patterns yeah. are secondary for us to price action. So okay. we would never, uh, you know, if small caps had just peaked in September, let's use last year for an example. Sure, sure. And they were just starting to roll over and, and breath was deteriorating. We would not say, well, seasonals say that they should bottom here and, and start rallying. That may be a, a small support, but that's not the quarter of thesis. So Got it. right now, the quarter of thesis is that we've we've gone through a sideways consolidation. We're starting to see inter, internals breath momentum pick up a bit in small caps. They've underperformed for about a year. And yeah. they're starting to just start to turn up on both an absolute and relative basis. So kind of. <clears throat> to us, that's the main message. And then the seasonal backdrop is just kind of a supportive factor. Yeah. Um, but it is a little tricky. And, and again, remember seasonals and all these cycles, they're just an average of many years of data. So mm, yeah. there's times when, to your point, when it's it does work and when yeah. it doesn't, overall on average, is, we know this is what tends to happen. Right. And when it lines up with the underpinnings of the of the charts, that, that's a more powerful message, but it's yeah, yeah, yeah. the only message. So the takeaway is pay attention to price, it sounds yes. like. <laughs> Good. Okay. I can I can buy into that. <laughs> 
What, um, so for someone just getting started who's less familiar with technical analysis, trying to get their head around it, what would you suggest they read? Where would you suggest they go? Or what, you know, for the younger Jonathan just getting into the markets, what would you give yourself there to try and figure out? Um, yeah, so I think the, uh, the CMT curriculum is, is, the, is certainly mm. the starting point. Some, yep. of the, some of the basic classic uh, technical analysis books. Yeah. Um, it's certainly going to give you a broad overview of, of everything that, that we all went through. Yeah. And then you kind of, after going through that, you can kind of see what works for you. Really, yeah. To me, that's the main message. I mean, there's a thousand indicators out there. Um, I think at the end of the day, we all <clears throat> get that all these indicators are derived from price. Yeah. Uh, so it's really, you got to kind of go through the, the material and find what works for you because some, some people are momentum <clears throat> Uh, followers. Some people are meter version followers. Some people use MACD. Some people use stochastics. And and at the end of the day, you, you just have to f go through your process and find what works for you. Yeah. Um, I also think now with the age of social media, there's a lot of content out there and a lot of very smart people putting out their content out there. Yeah. Uh, you know, you can overdo it and you can, you know, potentially get too much information. Yeah. But at the same time, there's there's a lot of really value add out there um on on twitter and, and if you follow the right people and kind of uh you know again it's really just you gotta look at what's out there and find out what works for you it's funny that the low barrier of entry with things like social media i feel like it's a very good thing but also a very cloudy thing right Absolutely. i mean it, it brings some really good content out you wouldn't see otherwise but you got to filter through exactly. it uh which is uh which is a bit of a challenge right um this was fantastic, Jonathan. Thanks so much for sitting yeah. down with us. Really appreciate it. Hope to see you again on the uh, on the show Absolutely. down the road. Absolutely, it's great to be here. Awesome. Thanks, Jonathan. Thank hey guys, Grayson Rose here with StockCharts.com. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Remember, if you did, give us a like down below. Leave us a comment. We'd love to hear from you. And most importantly, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel for daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial minds. We'll see you back here very soon. Happy charting, my friends.